Hello everyone, this is Shiv Dixit, and today I'll be giving you a lecture on ischemic stroke. My objectives for this lecture are for you to be able to understand the definition and presentation of a stroke, to learn the main etiologic classifications of ischemic stroke, to be able to clinically evaluate a patient with ischemic stroke, to recognize common imaging findings in stroke patients, to perform appropriate initial management of an acute ischemic stroke, and to evaluate for and address underlying etiologies of an ischemic stroke in order to prevent recurrence and improve long-term outcomes in your patients. So to begin with, uh, what is a stroke? A stroke is whenever a deficit in the blood supply to the brain leads to injury or death of neuronal tissue. We traditionally divide strokes into two different types, ischemic, which account for the vast majority, 80% of strokes, uh, and hemorrhagic strokes. Hemorrhagic strokes are associated with bleeding into the brain parenchyma, which uh, contributes to the deficits, whereas ischemic strokes are not associated with bleeding. Altogether, strokes are the fifth leading cause of death and leading cause of long-term disability in the U.S., according to the American Heart Association. And so early recognition and treatment of patients with stroke is really vital to reducing this uh, long-term disability. So how do we recognize and suspect a stroke? A uh, stroke should always be high under differential whenever you have a patient who presents with new onset of neurologic deficits, such as altered mental status, weakness, or an altered sensorium. Now it's easy to mistake a stroke for uh, other etiologies of these similar symptoms, which can include uh, metabolic encephalopathy from electrolyte disturbances or infection, a seizure with uh, what's called Todd's paralysis, a complex migraine, which can sometimes include symptoms of hemiplegia or neuropathy. But uh, mislabeling patients with actual strokes as having one of these conditions can be really serious and detrimental uh, since if a stroke isn't caught and treated appropriately early on, it can lead to permanent disability and even death. Now, it's useful here to bring up that in the past, a big distinction was made between the category of ischemic strokes and transient ischemic attacks, or TIAs. And previously, these uh, TIAs were defined as uh, brief episodes of neurologic impairment that resolved whereas uh, strokes were characterized by prolonged neurologic deficits. Uh, with the newer definition of TIAs, it's no longer a question of how long the symptoms lasted, but whether or not there were findings on MRI of uh, tissue injury. And so because you do need an MRI to distinguish between a TIA and a, 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 a full-blown ischemic stroke, uh, this distinction uh, at least initially in the clinical evaluation, has become somewhat more meaning meaningless. Now, when we look specifically at ischemic strokes, uh, we typically break them down into five major uh, categories. First, there are the large vessel or atherombolic diseases, which involve narrowing or obstruction of the large vessels, such as the carotid arteries, vertebral arteries, and basal artery. This accounts for about 20% of uh, ischemic strokes. Next, there are the cardioembolic strokes, which uh, involve embolization of a clot uh, coming from the heart. Then there are the small vessel or lacuna strokes, accounting for about 25% of strokes ischemic strokes. Um, there are a few rare etiologies which count for less than 5% of strokes, which will include things like hypercoagulability and certain genetic disorders that predispose patients to stroke. And finally, in situations where no clear cause of stroke has been identified despite initial testing, we label those as the cryptogenic strokes, and those account for uh, about 30% of initial stroke cases, although eventually many of these patients are found to have a cause. 
Let's go through them in detail. So the large vessel or atherombolic strokes, um, they're caused by occlusion of the large arteries. Uh, the tip of diagnostic test that will let you identify these kind of strokes are head and neck imaging with either a CT angiogram or a uh, magnetic resonance angiogram. The risk factors for developing these kind of strokes are the same as what would cause other cardiovascular diseases such as myocardial infarction and peripheral arterial disease, which would include um, conditions such as hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, and smoking. Here's a depiction of how large vessel atherosclerosis can lead to stroke. Uh, this is a patient with carotid artery stenosis as a result of atherombolic disease that's narrowing the carotid arteries. This restricts blood flow to the brain and can cause symptoms of a stroke. Cardioembolic strokes are caused when a clot forms and then travels from the heart to the brain as a result of some predisposing condition or structural heart disease. The conditions that are best known to promote cardioembolic strokes are atrial fibrillation, which accounts for the vast majority of cardioembolic strokes, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, where the uh, pooling and stasis of blood caused by the poor cardiac output leads to uh, the propensity to form strokes in the uh, to perform clots in the ventricles. There are atrial septal defects and ventricular septal defects that lead to what are called paradoxical emboli, where venous thromboembolic disease can cross directly from the left side, right side of the heart to the left side of the heart, and then enter into the systemic circulation bypassing the lungs. Finally, there are patients who develop septic emboli to their brain as a result of infective endocarditis. Uh, on imaging, these strokes are usually characterized by multiple focal areas of infarct uh, due to showering of the emboli. And in this diagram, we see a, a clot that formed in the patient's left atrium, likely as a result of atrial fibrillation it then passed into the left ventricle and then outward into the aorta, where it then traveled up the carotid artery and finally lodged itself into the patient's middle cerebral artery, causing an area of injury to the brain. Small vessel or lacunar strokes are characterized by uh, two pathophysiologic processes called lipohyalinosis and microatheroma. Uh, these are a narrowing of these small arteries supplying the uh, subcortical structures in the brain as a result of chronic hypertension and diabetes that are left uncontrolled. In lipohyalinosis, you have thickening and narrowing of the uh, vessel lumen as a result of the thickening of the walls. And in microatheromas, uh, small plaques form inside the lumen and obstruct blood flow. The arteries that are involved are the lenticulostriate and thalamoperforator arteries. And they're typically characterized by what are called the lacunar syndromes. And most of these typically involve either motor, sensory, or both uh, types of deficits that affect the entire half of one side of the body. So that's the face, the upper extremity, and the lower extremity all on one side. Here's a diagram showing the small lenticulostriate arteries and where blockage of these vessels leads to infarction in this area, which includes the basal ganglia and internal capsule. And there are also the thalamoperforate arteries coming off the posterior circulation which supply the thalamus. Next, there's a handful of miscellaneous conditions that can cause a stroke. Uh, these are very rare. The hypercoagulable states, including factor V Leiden mutation, protein C and S deficiencies, uh, the prothrombin gene mutation, antithrombin deficiency, the antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, seen in patients with lupus, uh, 
uh, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, which is associated with uh, hypercoagulability and uh, venous clots in unusual areas. And finally, more recently, we've seen uh, patients infected by the SARS-CoV-2 virus, uh, especially young patients with no other risk factors for stroke, developing stroke after infection. And many of these symptoms are attributed to the hypercoagulability uh, attributed to the uh, COVID-19 infection. There are the watershed strokes, which are associated with states of global hyperperfusion, uh, which can be seen in a patient with uh, shock. These usually lead to bilateral linear defects, uh, generally at the junction of the anterior cerebral artery territory and the middle cerebral artery territory, which includes the parts of the brain responsible for sensory and motor function to the hands. There are a handful of genetic conditions that predispose uh, young patients to early strokes. These include Moya Moya syndrome, the uh, pair of very rare conditions called carousel and catacil. These stand for cerebral autosomal recessive or autosomal dominant arteriopathy with subcortical infarcts and leukoencephalopathy. Again, very rare, but can be tested, uh, particularly the autosomal dominant form, if the patient has no other predisposing risk factors, but does have a family history of early strokes. And finally, sickle cell disease, where early strokes are a very uh, poor prognostic uh, finding in these, in these patients, and which requires plasma exchange therapy sorry, exchange transfusion um, to improve the symptoms. This is a picture showing an arteriogram of a patient with Moya Moya syndrome. Uh, here we see the a normal looking carotid artery that's entering into the brain. And then at this point, instead of branching off as it normally should into distinct ACA anterior uh, cerebral arteries, middle cerebral artery, uh, and forming the normal circle of Willis, the artery at this point is just branched off into multiple branches, uh, which then subdivide into hundreds of thousands of small, little, very poorly patterned arteries. Um, and this form of circulation is, is much, much less efficient at perfusing the brain and tends to lead to early onset strokes. Finally, the cryptogenic strokes are a diagnosis of exclusion that we make after no obvious cause of, of a stroke can be identified despite a thorough initial investigation. It turns out that many cases of cryptogenic stroke are actually associated with silent atrial fibrillation or patent foramen ovale, and often if further tests are done, uh, long-term, they can catch these conditions and an intervention can be performed to reduce the recurrence of stroke in these patients. While clinically evaluating a, a patient with a suspected stroke, we have a number of scoring systems and clinical tools to help us out. One of the most important is the NIH stroke scale, and so this is a standardized tool that helps us to grade the severity of stroke symptoms using a bunch of uh, questions and physical exam maneuvers uh, covering multiple neurologic domains. So we can actually use this to guide our initial examination of a patient with suspected stroke. Uh, this is graded on a scale of one, uh, well, 0 to 42. A patient with a score of 1 to 5 has mild stroke symptoms. Uh, 6 to 14 are moderate symptoms, 15 to 24 are severe symptoms, and then 25 all the way up to 42 are very severe symptoms. Here is a list of the questionnaire and uh, physical exam maneuvers to be covered in the NIH stroke scale. Uh, 
starts with basic questions uh, to address the patient's level of consciousness and awareness and orientation, examination of the patient's uh, vision, motor function in all extremities, coordination, sensory function, and language and sensation. Next, we have the modified Rankin scale or MRS. This is a tool used to measure the degree of disability caused by a stroke. And we use it for prognostic purposes, research purposes, and also to guide what uh, further therapy would, might be beneficial in our patients. It's a score that ranges from zero to six, with zero being a patient with absolutely no symptoms, and six being a patient who actually does not survive the stroke. Generally, there's an important cutoff here where patients with scores of zero to three uh, wind up doing fairly well and being able to live independent lives, whereas uh, patients with scores higher than that uh, do very poorly, requiring long-term assisted care or not surviving at all. Finally, a useful score to triage patients, particularly with minor uh, symptoms or transient neurologic deficits, is the ABCD2 score. Patients are given one point if their age is greater than 60, another point if their initial blood pressure was greater than 140 over 90, uh, two points if their initial symptom involved uh, unilateral weakness, one point if the initial presenting symptom involved a speech disturbance such as dysarthria without weakness. Another two points if the duration of their symptoms was greater than 60 minutes. One point if the duration was between 10 and 59 minutes. And another point for patients with diabetes. After totaling up all the points, if the score was three or more, the patient uh, meets criteria for inpatient admission for evaluation, particularly if they don't have any way of getting good outpatient follow-up. So the initial steps for a patient presenting with a acute stroke or a suspected stroke are uh, all designed to protect an area of the brain called the ischemic penumbra, which is shown here. So whenever there's a stroke, let's say a blockage of the middle cerebral artery, as shown here, uh, the immediate tissue that's supplied by that vessel becomes infarcted and dies. Uh, this tissue can never be recovered. But the tissue that's surrounding it, where the blood flow is compromised but not completely lost, is the ischemic penumbra. This area is injured, um, but if prompt intervention is taken, it can be saved and the function can be preserved. So all of our therapy is trying to keep this area from getting more injured and potentially dying. So how can we keep that from happening? So the first step is to consult neuro neurology as soon as possible for immediate evaluation. You'll obtain a quick basic history from whatever source you can get it, uh, focusing on the time that the patient was last seen normal or at their baseline neurologic status. As soon as possible, you're going to obtain a CT head without contrast, uh, which can also be paired up with a CT angiogram of the head and neck with contrast. Adding this second step can be helpful, particularly in centers where endovascular intervention is an option to uh, speed patients down that pathway. One of the most important early branch points in the initial management is whether or not the patient is a candidate for administration of a fibro fibrinolytic agent, uh, uh, specifically TPA, or tissue plasminogen activator. This is the only evidence-based medical therapy that we have to uh, reverse a stroke and uh, protect this penumbra region alongside the 
mechanical thrombectomy, which is an invasive uh, surgical or interventional radiology technique. While it is very helpful to obtain uh, basic testing, such as a basic metabolic profile, CBC, uh, coagulation tests, troponin, and ECG, uh, only the patient's blood glucose needs to be checked before uh, administering TPA if they're a candidate. And so before discussing uh, TPA and its administration in detail, uh, let's first look at uh, some of the CT head findings that you're going to be particularly looking for in your stroke patients. This is a non-contrast CT head taken from a patient uh, shortly after the onset of stroke symptoms within a few hours. Uh, if you compare the air, area indicated by the arrow here to the corresponding area on the other side of the brain, you notice that the right side of the brain, which is the left side of the image, is generally a little darker, or in radiologic language, hypodense, compared to the region on the left side of the brain. In addition, you'll notice that while you can clearly make out the distinction between the white matter, the um, gray matter on the outside of the brain and the white matter inside the brain, on the left side, that distinction is lost in this area on the right side of the brain. And so the some of the early findings of stroke on a non-contrast CT are hypotenuation of the brain tissue and loss of gray-white matter differentiation. After a stroke has progressed for many hours, we see this area of the brain that's obviously much, much more hypodense than the surrounding tissue. In this patient who presented soon after uh, stroke-like symptoms, we see a very hyperdense finding, uh, which actually corresponds to the left middle cerebral artery. And the reason it's so dense on this side, but not the other side, is because that's the location where a clot had lodged itself. Being able to see this dense clot lodged in the middle cerebral artery uh, is called the dense MCA sign. And it can often be a sign that this patient might benefit from early mechanical thrombectomy um, and may not actually derive as much benefit from TPA. Although the most recent guidelines say that we should still try TPA in these patients. Finally, uh, one of the most important indications for performing a non-contrast CT head early is to identify this very hyperdense area inside the brain, uh, which indicates an area of hemorrhage. If hemorrhage is seen on a non-contrast CT, uh, we don't treat as ischemic stroke, instead we treat as hemorrhagic stroke, which is much more of a neuros neurosurgical emergency. Uh, and has much less in the way of medical management that can help this patient. Now, what about magnetic resonance imaging or MRI? MRI is essentially a tissue imaging modality that uses magnetic fields to look at the behavior of hydrogen nuclei, uh, which are found in different microenvironments in the body, uh, particularly fat and water. And because the Magnetic spin polarity of hydrogen nuclei can vary very greatly depending on the subtle changes in the microenvironment. Uh, we can use this to map out the behavior of different tissue types in the body. Now, in early strokes, uh, as a loss, as a result of the loss of blood supply to the neurons the sodium-potassium ATPases or sodium-potassium pumps shut down and this leads to imbalances in electrolytes which leads to a buildup of cytotoxic edema around the brain. Uh, this cytotoxic edema has a slightly different uh, proton signal uh, 
compared to other types of fluid in the body. And this can be detected by an MRI machine. In particular, the cytotoxic edema will appear within minutes on MRI as a hyperintensity on what's called diffusion weighted imaging or DWI and a hypointensity of the apparent diffusion coefficient image or ADC. Then as the stroke becomes more chronic, the DWI signal becomes more hypointense while the ADC image uh, corresponding to the area of the stroke will become more hyperintense. So let's see what that looks like. Here's a DWI image of a patient with an acute ischemic stroke. You see that this area of the brain is hyperintense, whereas in this corresponding ADC image of the same patient, the same area of the brain is hypointense. And this uh, pattern with the DWI and the ADC image is highly uh, characteristic of an acute ischemic stroke. We see here a angiogram, a magnetic resonance angiogram of the same patient. We see the two carotid arteries supplying the anterior circulation with the middle cerebral artery on each side, the anterior cerebral arteries, the anterior communicating artery, and the basal artery, which supplies the posterior circulation. And together, these form the circle of Willis up here. And we see here that the left middle cerebral artery is much less prominent compared to the right middle cerebral artery. It doesn't extend as far out into the brain, and the area of the brain corresponding to this infarct has very few blood vessels going to it. And so clearly there's a blockage around here somewhere that's limiting blood flow to this area and causing an inf infarct. Now let's talk about giving TPA. Uh, so TPA is indicated in patients who are greater than 18 years of age, who have a clinical suspicion of a stroke with at least moderate neurologic deficit, and who had a last seen normal time within three hours of presentation. You can extend this three hour window to 4.5 hours only in patients where none of the following are true. So they should not be greater than 80 years of old age uh, they shouldn't be diabetics who have had a previous history of stroke. They shouldn't be on any anticoagulation. And they shouldn't have a very severe stroke uh, where the NIH stroke scale on presentation was greater than 25. And if they don't meet any of those criteria, um, you can extend the TPA window to 4.5 hours. And finally, patients who have a significantly large infarction as seen on a uh, imaging encompassing greater than one third of, of the cerebral hemisphere should not get TPA as these patients have a high risk of hemorrhagic conversion. Here's a diagram showing how TPA works. So TPA or tissue plasminogen activator activates plasminogen into the active enzyme plasmin. Uh, plasmin then goes on to cleave fibrin, uh, which is a major component of the clot, into fibrin degradation products, which are measured as D-dimer on lab testing. So by rapidly breaking up the clot, uh, TPA helps to restore blood flow quickly to the infarcted area, to the um, ischemic area of the brain and preserve that penumbra. However, it's important to note that there are many exclusion criteria for giving TPA. These include uh, any patient who's suspected or has a history of hemorrhagic stroke or brain mass, patients with relatively minor strokes, so NIH stroke scale scores less than six, any history of a prior stroke, neurosurgery, or severe head trauma in the past three months, other surgery or uh, 
trauma in the past two weeks, any history of a GI bleed or GU bleed in the past three weeks, blood pressures greater than 185 systolic or 110 diastolic, unless you're able to control it with medications, patients who have a coagulopathy, including patients with an INR greater than 1.7 on warfarin, uh, recent heparin use with any elevation in their PTT, or any recent use of direct oral anticoagulation. Patients with uh, blood glucose less than 50 or greater than 400 should also not get TPA. And patients with a low platelet count less than 100,000 should also not get TPA. If a patient does meet the criteria for TPA, uh, this is how you should give it. Um, you should give 0.9 milligrams per kilogram with a maximum of 90 milligrams if the patient weighs more than 100 kilograms. You should give 10% as a rapid bolus and then the remaining 90% over the next hour. Admit these patients to ICU settings always because they do need close monitoring of their blood pressure and urologic status. You try to keep their blood pressure less than 185 systolic, less than 110 diastolic before the infusion, and then while the infusion is running, keep the blood pressure less than 180 systolic and 105 diastolic. Uh, in order to control their blood pressure, you should use uh, medications such as IV nicardipine or IV labetalol infusion. These are the best studied IV antihypertensives in acute stroke situations. Next, in that ICU setting, you're going to be performing frequent blood pressure and neuro checks. Typically, that's every 15 minutes for the first hour, then every 30 minutes for the following five hours, uh, and then every one hour for the remainder of the next 24 hours. After those first 24 hours, you'll repeat the CT head to look for any evidence of bleeding. Um, and you should repeat it emergently if the patient does develop any uh, sudden neurologic changes. If the repeat uh, CT scan shows evidence of intracranial hemorrhage, you'll be giving the patient cryoprecipitate to re reverse the TPA effect and consult neurosurgery immediately. Now, if the patient is not a candidate for TPA, but is within a six hour window of uh, last seen normal or has a dense vessel sign, these patients uh, can benefit from early mechanical thrombectomy. More recently, we've extended the six hour window, which I'll be discussing in the next slide. If the patient is not a candidate for either a TPA or mechanical thrombectomy, this is when you'll give high dose aspirin, 325 milligrams crushed, followed by 81 milligrams daily. Uh, and you should not be treating these patients blood pressure too aggressively for the first 24 hours, unless they have a concurrent myocardial infarction, acute heart failure, or aortic dissection. Always uh, look for patient uh, developing fevers after an acute stroke, give them medications such as acetaminophen to control their fever and look for uh, other etiologies such as infection. Target their blood glucose between 140 and 180. Keep the patient's NPO pending a swallow evaluation and consider normal saline infusions to keep them euvolemic. If herniation is present, uh, you'll be using techniques like hyperventilation and hypertonic fluids or mannitol to control their intracranial pressure and consult neurosurgery for any acute intervention. Finally, uh, patients who develop stroke are at very high risk for venous thromboembolic disease. So you should be treating uh, for DVT prophylaxis, at least with pneumatic compression devices. The evidence for use of anticoagulation such as subcutaneous heparin or enoxaparin is much less established. So intraarterial or endovascular therapy, uh, aside from TPA, this is the only other therapy that's proven to have a benefit in preserving the ischemic penumbra. Uh, 
One of the earliest pieces of evidence supporting this therapy was the Mr. Clean trial, which was published in the Netherlands in 2015. Um, this showed that intraarterial treatments, a variety of them including catheter-directed TPA, mechanical clot retrieval, and thrombectomy, uh, performed within six hours of stroke onset, reduced patient's disability, and had low added risk of complications compared to standard therapy with aspirin, etc. Subsequently, in 2018, the Diffuse 3 trial showed that uh, extending this window for mechanical thrombectomy to 16 hours after symptom onset uh, could be beneficial in patients who had a large penumbra to infarct size ratio as measured by perfusion imaging. In the same year, the DAWN trial was published uh, this trial showed that you can extend the window all the way up to 24 hours in patients where the degree of symptoms as measured by the NIH stroke scale was much significantly larger than the volume of the infarcted brain as measured on imaging. Here's a diagram showing uh, some of the intraarterial therapies that are used in stroke patients. In the top picture, a suction tip catheter is placed up against the clot and suction is applied to pull the clot out of the uh, atherosclerotic narrowed area and uh, open up the artery for blood flow. In typical mechanical thrombectomy, a special tool is used to drill into the clot, hook onto it, and then manually pull it out of the uh, narrowed vessel and open the vessel up again. This bottom image shows the concept of perfusion imaging. This is a CT-based technique that was applied in the Diffuse 3 trial. The concept is that special techniques with contrast can be used to measure the transit time of blood in the different parts of the brain, as well as a total cerebral blood flow. In infarcted and dead t uh, portions of the, of the brain, cerebral blood flow is essentially zero and transit time is markedly reduced. Whereas in the penumbra, transit time is reduced, but uh, cerebral blood flow is relatively preserved as a result of uh, the brain trying to compensate with vasodilation to these areas. So essentially, the purple areas on the left images show the core infarcted area that cannot be saved, uh, whereas the images on the right showing the green areas, these green areas are the uh, areas where um, there's ischemic penumbra that can be saved. If there is a certain ratio of ischemic penumbra to the core infarct area, um, these patients may meet the criteria for endovascular intervention. Now, after acutely stabilizing the patient, either with TPA, uh, endovascular intervention, or just aspirin and supportive care, uh, the next step in stroke management is to evaluate for potential causes of the stroke. Uh, it's the techniques we'll use to do that are to place a patient on telemonitoring for at least 24 hours to look for atrial fibrillation, which is a very significant cause of stroke. You can perform a transthoracic echocardiogram with a bubble study to look for a patent for aminobale, which would uh, produce a paradoxical embolus to the brain. We can look uh, at angio angiography of the head and neck vessels with a CT angi angiography or magnetic resonance angiography. You can perform a urine drug screen to look for cocaine-induced vasospasm. You can consider a hypercoagulable evaluation, particularly in young patients with no clear risk factors, although this is often done in, as an outpatient. Finally, patients who are not found to have a clear cause despite this above workup uh, and are labeled as having cryptogenic stroke uh, 
Uh, these patients might benefit from placement of an implantable loop recorder uh, for long-term monitoring for atrial fibrillation, silent atrial fibrillation, as this can then be treated and uh, reduce the recurrence of stroke. One of the mainstays of preventing a recurrent stroke is antiplatelet therapy. In first-time strokes, um, and also for primary prevention of strokes, the recommended agent is aspirin. For patients who have had a stroke while already taking aspirin, they can be switched from aspirin to clopidogrel or be started on the combination therapy of aspirin plus dipertamol. Dual antiplatelet therapy, which is aspirin plus clopidogrel, can be used in up to three months in patients who've had minor strokes with low NIH stroke skill scores or a TIA. Um, this was studied in the CHANCE trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2013. And it showed that this combination therapy just for three months reduced the uh, risk of recurrent strokes in this period. The benefit was not uh, significantly carried on after the three-month window. Statins should be started at maximal tolerated intensity to prevent atherosclerosis. And anticoagulation for atrial fibrillation should not be initiated right away, as it has little benefit in the early uh, peri-infarct uh, period, but can be started uh, after 4 to 14 days after a stroke, depending on the size of the stroke. Um, and a discussion with neurology should be considered before deciding when exactly to resume or initiate anticoagulation. Carotid endarterectomy or stenting is a common intervention that's performed when a patient has large vessel disease involving the carotid arteries. The current guidelines recommend that you perform this within two weeks of a non-severely disabling stroke. That's a stroke that's uh, produced a a modified ranking score of less than three or a TIA with 70 to 99% stenosis on imaging. It can be considered in male patients specifically with a stenosis of 50 to 69% who also have greater than five year life expectancy and are considered to be low operative risk. It's not indicated to operate on a patient with 100% stenosis as the risk to benefit ratio is very, very high. And since these patients often have uh, enough collateral circulation that the stenosis is probably not the major cause of the patient's symptoms. The CREST trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2010 showed that uh, compared surgery to stenting and found that both were about equally efficacious in uh, preventing stroke, although stenting was associated with slightly uh, lower risk of perioperative MI, and surgery was associated with a slightly lower risk of perioperative stroke. This is an example of both modalities in a direct surgical endarterectomy. An incision is made in the carotid artery, and the atherosclerotic plaque is excised, and afterward the um, incision is stitched back up. In stenting, which can be done more non-invasively, uh, a balloon can be used to perform angioplasty and open up the blockage, and a, a stent can be placed inside the vessel to hold it open. Rehabilitation uh, is a very important part of stroke management and can prevent long-term disability and lead to early recovery in the patient's uh, neurologic function. It's found that aggressive, very early mobilization within the first 24 hours of stroke is, can actually be harmful to the patient, but uh, at least early evaluation by an interdisciplinary team consisting of a physical therapist, occupational therapist, speech uh, therapist, uh, potentially an ophthalmologist if visual symptoms are present, and a physiatrist specializing in rehab medicine uh, has had significant benefit in reducing long-term deficits. Other interventions that may be beneficial in these patients 
uh, first of all, routine seizure prophylaxis has not found uh, not been found to have a significant benefit in these patients. However, if the patient does develop a seizure, uh, you should start seizure uh, anticonvulsant medications. It's so recommended that some form of enteral nutrition should be started within seven days for optimal benefit in these patients. And there are certain cases where neuro neurosurgical procedures would be helpful. So a ventriculostomy is indicated whenever a patient develops hi obstructive hydrocephalus uh, as a result of the stroke. And decompressive craniectomy is indicated for large cortical strokes that cause a mass effect, especially if you've already tried uh, medical therapy uh, such as hyperventilation and mannitol or hypertonic saline. And these have not proven to be effective in reducing intracranial pressure. Note that certain strategies, such as the administration of barbiturates and uh, hypothermia, have not been effective at controlling intracranial pressure, specifically that's due to an ischemic stroke. Here is a uh, a depiction of the uh, main neurosurgical inventions that, that would, might be beneficial in an acute ischemic stroke. First, the ventriculostomy is indicated for obstructive hydrocephalus. It's uh, performed by creating an incision in the patient's uh, scalp, drilling a hole into the skull, and then under special endoscopic guidance, inserting a catheter into the patient's ventricles to relieve pressure and drain the cerebrospinal fluid. In a decompressive craniectomy, uh, a bone flap is removed from the patient's skull, and this allows the swollen portion of the brain to uh, relieve pressure by protruding out outside of the skull. This can reduce the risk of fatal herniation syndrome, such as tonsil herniation. So in summary, uh, ischemic stroke is injury or death of brain tissue due to impaired blood flow. Patients suspected to have an ischemic stroke should get an emergent neuro neurology evaluation and get an urgent non-contrast CT of the head. Initial history should be focused on the TPA inclusion or exclusion criteria. And the physical examination should focus on the NIH stroke scale assessment. TPA and endovascular intervention are the only therapies that we have that are proven to save the ischemic penumbra and prevent deficits long term. Patients with ischemic stroke should be evaluated for the most common etiologies, which would include atrial fibrillation, structural heart diseases, and stenosis of the large arteries of the head and neck. Recurrence of stroke is prevented by properly controlling our, the patient's blood pressure, glucose, and lipids, encouraging smoking cessation, treating uh, structural conditions such as a carotid artery stenosis, atrial fibrillation, and uh, patent foramen ovales, uh, providing anticoagulation as needed. Uh, especially for those patients with hypercoagulable state or atrial fibrillation. And then to maximize recovery, it's highly recommended to initiate timely consultation with rehabilitation services to give early DVT prophylaxis and early feeding. Thank you for joining me on this lecture on ischemic stroke. I hope you enjoyed and have a wonderful day.